the Roman Catholic Church does not follow the Bible. They deny the sufficiency and also the inerrancy of Scripture. They go by tradition as well as papal decrees, canons and, uh, you know, of the decrees of the councils. Furthermore, they contradict the Bible in their doctrines and their practices. Well, they're teaching about salvation. Uh, for example, the Council of Trent says, whosoever says, or if anyone says, that the sacraments of the new law are not essential to salvation, but that without them, through faith in Christ alone, a man can be saved, let him be anathema. So they teach that you can't come to Christ and be saved through faith in him. You only can be saved through the sacraments of the Catholic Church. That's not biblical. Uh, when Paul was asked, sirs, what must we do to be saved? He didn't say a word about sacraments, baptism as an infant, wearing a scapular, prayers to Mary, to the saints, uh, all of the things that the Catholic Church says are essential. So the Catholic Church denies the Bible. Uh, furthermore, the Bible says that Christ appeared once in the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In contrast to the Old Testament sacrifices that had to be repeated, Hebrews 10 says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. By one sacrifice, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. The Catholic Church says, no, Christ is continually being sacrificed. The Catholic Church says, no, Christ is this little wafer, and he's being offered over and over and over. Uh, the gospel, according to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. No, the Catholic Church says, he is dying for our sins. He's continually being dying. So they reject the sufficiency of scripture, reject the sufficiency of the cross. Christ said it's finished. Catholic Church says it's not finished. Christ is still dying. Uh, Vatican II begins, for it is in the sacred liturgy, especially in the sacrifice of the Eucharist, that the work of our redemption is accomplished. No, the Bible says redemption was accomplished on the cross. The Catholic Church says it's in the process. So there are many ways in which the Catholic Church de uh, contradicts Scripture and in that which is most essential regarding the salvation of souls. Well, the Gospel of Roman Catholicism uh, doesn't even compare with the Bible. The Gospel of Roman Catholicism is you get infused righteousness and it's by God's grace, of course, and only through what Christ did, but you have to become righteous, and therefore a Catholic is always under a cloud of guilt, but I'm not righteous. I'm trying to be righteous enough to be saved, whereas the Bible says that Christ died for sinners. He justifies the ungodly. Uh, so there's a big difference. That's good news. To, uh, Romans 4, 5, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So I'm not made perfect, but in Christ I have forgiveness. The Catholic Church has not changed. It can't change. Its leaders are infallible. Every council quotes from previous councils. So Vatican II quotes from uh, the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent pronounced more than 100 anathemas, damning evangelicals and the gospel they preach, which the Bible preaches. Vatican II said, this sacred council proposes again all the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. The Pope in 1995 celebrated the 450th anniversary of the beginning of the Council of Trent. He said, it is all in full force and effect. You just had a supposed declaration by Lutherans and Catholics. This is not the church. These are theologians, Lutheran theologians and Catholic theologians. After 30 years of discussion, oh, we now agree on justification by faith. But the Vatican says, no, we don't accept it. And furthermore, at that time, this is very recently, the Vatican said, we are not prepared 
to rescind any of the anathemas. Now, the one change in Vatican II, <coughs> there was a change uh, regarding indulgences. Previously, uh, you got a 200 days knocked off of your time in purgatory, three years, two years, and the change was, we don't know how long you have to spend in purgatory. So we will no longer talk about so many days or months or years knocked off, but we will only say it is either a plenary or a partial indulgence, which is meaningless. I get a plenary indulgence, and five minutes later, I sin. I'm back where I started from. But that was one change that they did make. It, in fact, it's called the revision of, on indulgences. Well, this is the very heart of the Catholic Church. When the Pope speaks ex cathedra, that is from the chair of Peter, supposedly, to the whole church, he is said to be without error. I mean, the popes lived horrible lives. <laughs> Several popes died at the hands of a husband who found them in bed with their wife. Uh, there were popes who were the sons of supposedly celibate popes. I mean, some of the popes were the most vicious monsters the world has ever seen. Uh, pope Innocent III wiped out the entire city of Bézier, France, 60,000 people, women and children and called it the crowning achievement of his papacy. I mean, the sins of the popes are, are just a, a matter of history. But they distinguished between impeccability, that is, uh, living a perfect life, and infallibility, uh, so that supposedly, as Christ's vicar, when they speak to the whole church, they're infallible. But as a matter of fact, popes contradicted popes. Popes excommunicated popes, even exhumed the body <laughs> of, of a pope to excommunicate him. So they're not infallible, but they claim to be. Therefore, to acknowledge that there was some error and to make correction uh, would undermine the, the whole system. Well, first of all, the Bible does not say that the authority is in a man other than Christ or it's in a church or a church body. The authority is scripture. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he quoted the Bible. He said, it is written. He always went back to scripture. He indicted the rabbis for their tradition. And he said, you have made void the word of God by your tradition. Never does the Bible say anything good about tradition. And never does it say that a church has to decide what is valid, you know, wh what are the proper books of the Bible and so forth. They didn't do that for the Old Testament. The Catholic Church, of course, claims that it did it for the New Testament and that it alone has the authority then to interpret the Bible. But that undermines Scripture entirely because I am accountable to God, not to some human being. And so we have all through the Bible, for example, uh, <clears throat> Psalm 119.9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. It doesn't say he has to check it out with a rabbi. Uh, when Christ writes his seven uh, letters to the seven churches of Asia, he doesn't say they're accountable to some headquarters in Rome. They're accountable to him. And each one of us is accountable to God. Uh, so the Catholic Church says, no, we are the authority. We alone can interpret the Bible. You come to us because we have, uh, we are in contact with God. We have the treasury of God's graces that Christ earned on the cross. We distribute them to you in the sacraments. But that's not what the Bible, the Bible says. The Bible says we are accountable to God individually. You can't pass that responsibility off to some body of men. The pronouncements of the councils uh, claiming that uh, Christ's sacrifice on the cross was not sufficient. The teaching of purgatory uh, is not biblical. That's an error. You don't find that in the Bible. And the idea that the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross wouldn't get you to heaven there are penalties. You, your sins must be expiated. 
and that can only be done through the flames of purgatory. But the Bible doesn't talk about me expiating my sins. I can't expiate my sins. And furthermore, it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So my blood isn't being shed in purgatory. I'm suffering in, in the flames of purgatory. A, a scapular, for example, uh, if I can find one here quickly. Where do I have a scapular? Pardon me, I got one in my pocket, I think. Uh, for example, a scapular. Uh, Pope John the 22nd claimed that in 1322, Our Lady of Mount Carmel personally appeared to him and uh, told him that we should wear the scapular, gave him the promise that the Saturday after their, your death, if you die wearing the scapular, she would personally go into purgatory and take you out. Now, the scapular on one end has a picture of supposedly Mary and Jesus. On this end, this is what the scapular says. Whosoever dies wearing this scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. Now, what kind of a God lets you out of hell because you wear a scapular? So, the Catholic Church has medals. Uh, for example, uh, Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal in 1830. Mary supposedly appeared to Catherine Labouré with her heel on the serpent's head because uh, uh, many ca Catholic translations, now they've been changing some of them lately, but <clears throat> all Catholic translations of the Bible originally, uh, Genesis 3.15, instead of saying the seed of the woman, that is Christ would bruise the serpent's head, it said the woman would bruise the serpent's head. So Mary appears with her heel on the serpent's head. She is the one who destroys Satan and said mint this medal is called the, the Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal. Millions of Catholics wear this medal for protection. It's like a Mormon's magic underwear. Uh, that's, that's contrary to the Bible. But the Catholics accept this. Uh, they accept um, the apparitions, not all of them, but some of the apparitions of Mary, for example, Our Lady of Fatima. Uh, all the popes have accepted this. For example, all of the popes have accepted Our Lady of Fatima as a genuine apparition. Pope John Paul II believes that she saved his life. He said he felt her motherly protection uh, during the assassination attempt. Now, Mary, in the apparition, she promises to be with all Catholics everywhere. Now, she would have to be omnipresent and she would have to be omnipotent. Uh, 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 Vatican II uh, and the Catechism says uh, that the Virgin has been known as the Mother of God, to whose protection the faithful turn in all their dangers and needs. Now, if the faithful can be protected from all dangers and all needs will su be supplied by Mary, then she must be God. She is literally their God. And why would they pray to her in, instead of to God? So they accept the apparitions. Now let me tell you what some of the apparitions have said. Our Lady of Fatima said, many souls perish and go to hell because there's no one to make sacrifice for them. But Christ made the sacrifice on the cross. So there is a denial of the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. So we have so many contradictions uh, now, if you want contradictions between popes to show their lack of infallibility, there were popes who took literally, now Catholics claim to take literally, John 6, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. So there were popes who said, well then, the, and baby, even though it's been baptized, if it hasn't yet partaken of the mass, it's doomed, it's lost. <laughs> And they said, we must interpret this literally. But then they were overruled by later popes who said, no, no, that's not right. And, and they changed it. So there have been contradictions um, down, down through history. But basically, the Catholic Church contradicts the clear teaching of Scripture. Most of the evangelicals who are converting to Catholicism say that it was because they began reading the so-called Church Fathers. Uh, and they saw that, well, they seemed to believe Catholic doctrine. 
And, uh, for, well, first of all, these are selective quotes, okay. But Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He said, after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in, not sparing the flock, inside. Jude said, certain men have crept in unawares. So the, the Bible talks about apostasy. The epistles were written to correct error already in the church. So why should I look to, say, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, who supposedly knew Peter? Well, I don't care what Ignatius, I mean, it might be interesting historically as to what Ignatius of Antioch thought, but what I want to know is what does the Bible say? Because Paul said even the elders of Ephesus that he had trained would be corrupted. So it's not going to do you any good to go back as far as you can. Why not go to the Bible to see what the Bible says? Now, that's where we read of authentic Christianity. Now, as far as church history being on the side supporting Roman Catholicism, my goodness, I would think they would be embarrassed to say that. Church history tells you, uh, read not, not uh, evangelicals or not Protestants, but read Will Durant, for example. And Will Durant will tell you that the slaughter of Christians by the Catholic Church made the slaughter of Christians by the Roman emperors look like a Sunday school picnic. You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but far more Christians were killed by the Catholic Church than, the, than, than ever were killed by the Roman emperors. The, the wealth of this church, I mean, how can this man with a good conscience claim to be the vicar of Christ, who had one robe that the soldiers gambled over, he said he had nowhere to lay his head, he lives in a palace of 1,100 rooms. He wears the finest silk robes embroidered with, with gold and, 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 and pearls and, and, and jewels and, and so forth. Um, and furthermore, he presides over an earthly kingdom. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. The popes fought with armies and navies to build an earthly kingdom that is without rival. They have power and authority today. This is why you have ambassadors to the Vatican. Arafat goes there, but so does everybody else. The United States has ambassadors to the Vatican. They go hat in hand. They must wear black. Only the Pope can wear white. They go there begging favors. Uh, the Popes own the world. Uh, Alexander VI drew a line down the world in 1492. He gave the western part to Ferdinand and Isabel of Spain. That's why we have Latin America. He gave the eastern half of the world to Portugal. Brazil sticks out. That's why they speak Portuguese in Brazil today. Uh, I mean, they controlled the world. They set up emperors. Emperors quaked when the Pope threatened excommunication. Alexander III excommunicated the Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbarossa, the, the red beard. Uh, and the emperor became angry. And he came with his armies against the armies of the pope. You know who won? The pope won. The pope's armies defeated the emperor's armies. And Frederick Barbarossa came and put his face in the dust in front of the pope at Venice. And the pope put his heel on the emperor's neck while the cardinals chanted, thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder and so forth. I mean, I can give you example after example after example. They ruled over the kings of the earth. Jesus never did that. He, in fact, he said to his disciples, you will be hated of all men. I've chosen you out of the world, not to rule uh, the world. So church history refutes the claims of Catholicism. They prove, church history proves that the Catholic Church does not represent Jesus Christ at all. For a thousand years before the Reformation, they slaughtered, the popes slaughtered true Christians by the millions, simply because they would not give their allegiance to Rome. They would not come under Rome. Now these were the Albigensians, for example, named after the, the area of Albi. At one time, the Albig in, in France, at one time, southern France 
was the most prosperous part of Europe. It was largely populated by evangelical Christians, the Albigenses. Now, they were related to the Waldensians in northern Italy, still a major uh, evangelical church in Italy today. It took the popes about a century to wipe out the Albigensians. There were more crusades with more soldiers involved, knights and knaves and so forth involved, to exterminate Christians than ever went to the Holy Land. These were the major crusades. Uh, so this happened a thousand years before the Reformation. After the Reformation, of course, they're burning them at the stake by the, by the thousands. Today, there is opposition by the Catholic Church. It would be everywhere if they could. In Mexico, in the area of Chiapas, for example, about 10,000 native Indian Christians have been driven from their homes, from their villages, from their fields, and so forth. You've got uh, Christians are being killed even in the area of Acapulco, uh, in Peru, and other parts. You ask any uh, Christian from South America, they will tell you the major opposition to the gospel comes from the Catholic Church. And if they can martyr Christians, they will do it. So this is happening today, but on a much smaller scale than when the Catholic Church ruled the world. You see, it, this document, ECT, as it's known, the title says everything, Evangelicals and Catholics together. It doesn't say some Evangelicals and some Catholics. It doesn't say Evangelicals and Bible-believing Catholics, or Evangelicals and Evangelical Catholics, even if there were such a thing. All evangelicals and all Catholics together in what? Fighting abortion or homosexuality or pornography? No. In the Christian mission in the third millennium. What is the Christian mission? To go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, how can you join with those who have a false gospel in preaching the gospel into all the world? Now, there, the major problem with ECT is it makes a mockery of the Reformation. It denies the Reformation. It makes a mockery of the martyrs. Uh, after all, there was a Reformation, and back there, these were Roman Catholics, many of them priests, some bishops. They saw that the Catholic Church had departed from the Bible, that it was preaching a false gospel, that they were lost. And they came to faith in Christ. They got saved. They didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. They wanted a reformation of the Catholic Church. They wanted the Catholic Church to reform. And instead, they were excommunicated, burned at the stake, and the leading theologians of the Catholic Church met in the Council of Trent from 1545 to 63 to consider the concerns of the Reformers rejected every one. Salvation by faith alone? No. Salvation by grace alone? No. Get rid of images? No. Priesthood of all believers? No. And they pronounced more than 100 anathemas, damning anybody who rejects the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. And that includes evangelicals today. The evangelical signers of this document have been anathematized. So what it does is it says, I guess there wasn't a Reformation. For 450 years, we've acknowledged there was a big difference between evangelicals and Catholics. Such a big difference that they were willing to die for their faith. And the others believed it so strongly, they were willing to burn them at the stake for their faith. Now, it makes a mockery of this. I guess they just believed the same thing and, and didn't realize it. So what it says is, I'm quoting it verbatim now, it says, we thank God, this is evangelicals and Catholics, we thank God for the discovery of one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. So Martin Luther, could have said to the Pope, we thank God for the discovery of one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, what was this whole thing about? The Reformation. That they, <clears throat> they believed sincerely in their hearts there was such a difference that those who believed the Catholic gospel were lost. And that's why they believed the gospel of the Bible and they got saved and they wanted the others to be saved. Now for 450 years, We've had that clear distinction. We've known that there's the difference between night and day, between heaven and hell, uh, between what evangelicals believe and teach and what Catholics believe and teach. And suddenly, it's all just a semantic misunderstanding. 
we're, we're, we're all united in preaching the gospel. It's a lie. It's a fraud. Unless you're going to say that the Reformation and 450 years of church history was a big mistake. It's possible that there are some Catholics who would be my brothers and sisters in Christ because they have come to faith in Christ. But when they do, they come into a deep conflict between what they now know is the truth of the Word of God, salvation through faith in Christ, and what the Catholic Church teaches. And they don't want to leave because of their family, their friends, and this has been their life, but they can't stay because they are now, for example, how can a Catholic go to Mass and say that this little wafer is the body and blood of Jesus who is being offered? Uh, let me give you another anathema. Uh, well, I didn't complete the thought. How can a Catholic go to Mass and say that this little wafer is the body and blood of Jesus Christ being offered, immolated is the term, suffering for sin? <laughs> on the Catholic altar when the Bible says he finished the work on the cross and he's in a resurrected glorified body at the Father's right hand. How can you take Jesus who's in a resurrected glorified body and through transubstantiation put him back in a pre-crucifixion body and offer him on the, on the Catholic altar? So you can't do that. I've talked to Catholics, uh, say in Warsaw, the leader of the uh, Catholic charismatic movement there. I sat down with him in Dublin, the same person. And I said, look, how can you, you don't really believe that that little wafer, is, well, no, we don't believe that anymore. Then how can you go there? How can you participate in this? Well, I just take it as a remembrance, you know. Uh, but the other people don't know that you're taking it as a, re as a remembrance. You are condoning. You're going along with this. Well, I want to stay in the Catholic Church in order to witness and, and, and win others. But wait a minute. How are you witnessing to them? By participating in this and seeming to condone it? As soon as you say in clear terms to those around you, this is not biblical and salvation is only by faith in Christ as his finished work, you'll be thrown out. Uh, now, here's the distinction, for example. You have all this talk of unity, okay? Promise keepers, uh, for example. We're going to consummate in the year 2000 a big Eucharistic celebration. The Lord's Supper will all get together. But a Catholic is forbidden to participate in a Protestant uh, uh, communion service, and a Protestant is forbidden to participate in a Catholic Mass. Why? Let me give you an anathema from the Council of Trent. Whoever says that the sacrifice of the Eucharist is merely a commemoration of a sacrifice completed on the cross 1900 years ago and denies that it is an ongoing sacrifice to be offered for sins of the living and the dead, let him be anathema. So if I'm a Catholic and I've come to faith in Christ, I believe he finished the work on the cross, how can I continue on in fellowship with a church that says he didn't finish the work, that salvation is in the process of being accomplished when I believe that it was accomplished? So yes, there could be a Catholic who's become a Christian but they are not going to stay in the Catholic Church very long. It's a contradiction in terms. Satan is not an atheist. He believes in God. He said, I will be like the Most High. He is the God of this world. He's the author of false religions. Satan's big uh, program is not to make atheists out of everybody, but just to pervert, just to corrupt the truth enough so that they think they're right with God. They think they're Christians when they're really not. So you don't write across a counterfeit counterfeit. You try to make a counterfeit as much like the real thing as you can. The Catholic Church is probably the closest counterfeit because Catholics believe Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. But you can't get the benefits of Christ except through the Catholic Church. So all down through history Satan has twisted the scriptures, has perverted uh, the truth in order to deceive. It's called the lie. And, and they come under a strong delusion. God says, you want to believe the lie? I'll help you believe the lie. But it is only through the truth that we're saved. Jesus said, you continue in my word. 
then you my disciples indeed you will know the truth and the truth will set you free so Satan counteracts the truth with a very clever just changing it enough so that it won't really save you so that you're really not believing the truth but you believed a lie thinking that it's the truth I don't know how to explain ECT uh, some of these men are friends of mine that I've respected uh, as evangelical leaders. By what alchemy have Catholics who burned us at the stake, who believe a different gospel, how have they become our brothers and sisters in Christ? How can you conscientiously say this? Now, these men must be deluded. Uh, how they can possibly be deceived to that extent, I don't know. I have no explanation for it. Well, there are Catholics who will say they're born again and they're saved by grace through faith. They've learned a lot of evangelical terminology now. Um, well, they're born again in infant baptism. Uh, that's where they get born again. It's infant baptism that forgives them from original sin, that brings them into the body of Christ. But the problem with a Catholic is you you never get saved. Uh, you have to keep renewing this through the sacraments, this righteousness that is being infused into you. That starts you out. Well, of course we're saved by grace, they would say. It's all of God's grace. But it's God's grace that makes it possible for me to be able to earn uh, my, my salvation. Uh, God you know, keeps putting his grace in me so that I can become righteous. But then the Catholic is looking to his righteousness rather than Christ's righteousness. And that's the problem. Uh, it's, you know, my good friend Bill Bright, I love Bill Bright. And Bill said to me, Dave, we're teaching Catholics in Ireland, for example, we're teaching Catholics the four laws. I said, Bill, every Catholic believes the four laws. They all believe Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again. That's not their problem. The problem is what else they believe. They believe that you can't get the benefits of Christ's death except through the sacraments. And furthermore, the benefit you're getting is an infusion of righteousness, and you've got to become righteous. That's why you have to suffer in purgatory to be purged, to expiate your sins in order to become clean enough to get to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. So the Catholic, when he talks about grace, when he talks about salvation, when he talks about redemption, uh, he, he justification, he can use the same terminology, but he has an entirely different meaning to all of those words. And Chuck Colson, who is a lawyer, he drew ECT, this document, in such a way that Catholics could sign it and evangelicals could sign it having different meanings to the key words. And that's a fraud. There is no real meeting of the minds. My concern is for the eternal destiny of souls. That's all I'm concerned about. Uh, the Bible says that there's only one way, that Christ had to pay the penalty. It's not the physical sufferings of Christ on the cross. That wouldn't save anybody. That would only add to our condemnation. It was because when he hung on the cross, he became the sin offering for our sins. He paid the penalty that his own infinite justice demanded. It's only on that basis. There's no salvation any other way. But the Catholic Church offers salvation by scapulars and prayers to Mary and sacraments and so forth. Let me put it this way. Last week, I went 120 miles an hour in a 20-mile school zone, and I got caught, and I got a ticket, and next week, when I get back to Oregon, I'm going to stand before the judge, and you say, wow, they're going to throw the book at you. I say, don't worry about it. I know the judge's mother. It's the Catholic thinks Mary's going to get him in. It's a matter, of, or you say, I go to the same church the judge goes to. Uh, no, it's not going to work. Going to church won't even get you off of a, a parking ticket. Uh, and it's not going to change God's laws. The penalty has to be paid, and only Christ paid the penalty. Now, as soon as I try to have some part in paying the penalty, 
prayers, penance, sacraments, wearing scapulars or medals or whatever, I am literally corrupting God's justice. That's like getting off of a, 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 a you know, a traffic fine by wearing something or giving to the some charitable organization and that will help me and so forth. No, it's a matter of justice. God's justice is perfect, it's infinite. He alone could pay the penalty. So that's why the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. The Bible makes it very clear, salvation is a gift. You can't pay for a gift. You can't earn a gift. You can't merit a gift. As soon as you do, try to, you have corrupted it. You have destroyed the gift. So this is what the whole Catholic system does. It corrupts God's justice and it denies that it must be received, salvation must be received as a gift that we can't merit. All you can do is receive it. <laughs> you can't work for it or merit it. But you see, as soon, this is the problem, way back to the Reformation now. The Catholic Church realized if very many people believe what these reformers are saying, we're out of business. As soon as people believe that they can come to Christ, just come to him by faith, and they can receive eternal life as a free gift, it's a done deal. <laughs> the Catholic Church is out of business. It's like in Matthew 23, Jesus said to the rabbis, and just put in our modern language, he said, you scoundrels, not only don't you go into heaven, but you prevent those who would. You stand in their way. You stand between them and God, and you have set up a system of religion that is so complicated, it would take a Philadelphia lawyer to unravel this thing, and the people are at your mercy because they can only get to God through you and your religious system. That's exactly what the Catholic Church has done. The Reformation said, that doesn't work. It's by faith in Christ alone as a free gift. And that's what the big conflict has been about for 450 years. And suddenly we have some men saying, oh, no problem. We all believe the same thing after all. They just didn't know it. Most Catholics don't realize something of really great importance, that if they do not obey what the Catholic Church says, what the magisterium and the Pope teaches, they're lost forever. Let me give you an example. This is Vatican II. Uh, it says, the church teaches that the practice of indulgences, a practice most beneficial to Christians and which has been authorized by the sacred councils, should be kept in the church. And it condemns with anathema those who say that indulgences are useless or the church does not have the authority to grant them. Okay? Now, <clears throat> you can talk to Catholics and say, do you believe in purgatory? I don't believe in purgatory. You believe in indulgences? I don't believe in indulgences. Then you can tell them, you have been anathematized by the highest authority of your church. Your local priest doesn't have to read you out. He doesn't have to excommunicate you. You don't even know you've been excommunicated. You can go to mass. You can go to confession. But unless you confess the sin of rejecting indulgences and purgatory, you are lost forever. Now this must be so because salvation is in the church. It's the church that, that uh, gives you salvation through its sacraments and its priesthood. So if you do not cooperate with what the church says, you come under their condemnation and you have no hope of salvation. You are lost eternally, whether you know it or not. And you can go to church, you can be faithful in mass and so forth. You've been anathematized by the highest authority of the Roman Catholic Church and you are finished. People say that the Catholic Church is changing. Well, it's changing to the extent that if you took a poll, probably 70% of the Roman Catholics do not agree with what the church teaches on abortion or homosexuality or, or contraception, uh, for example. But they still remain Catholics. Even a Catholic who uh, is dis, uh, disillusioned with the church, doesn't attend except maybe Easter and Christmas. When they come to die, they want a Catholic burial. They get extreme unction, the last rites, which supposedly straightens everything out, okay? Now, so you have some changes. You want to talk about changes? Well, some of the theologians at Notre Dame or at some seminary or somewhere 
oh, they become more liberal and so doesn't mean a thing. That hasn't changed the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. That hasn't changed Vatican II. That hasn't changed any of the councils. It hasn't changed the catechism. It hasn't changed uh, the code of canon law. <laughs> what the church really teaches has not changed one iota. In fact, the Pope, John Paul II, is clamping down. He's saying, we got to get back to what the church teaches. Uh, so, yes, you have Catholics out there, even theologians, who say, oh, it's changing and so forth. And they'll sign some documents. It doesn't mean a thing. How can you undo 1,500 years of dogmas that have been pronounced? And every council quotes from the previous council. They built upon this thing. How can you undo that? I don't know how you can possibly undo it. Now, there, the Catholic Church could change to this extent, and it may be in the process of becoming more liberal as to who it, it embraces. And already you have priests and nuns who practice yoga. They're into the new age. Uh, and that doesn't really matter so long as they still give loyalty to the Pope. So I can foresee that the Catholic Church could grow and it could gain more adherence by broadening what you're allowed to believe and practice and so forth uh, and not really uh, maybe enforcing the anathemas. Uh, in fact, the Pope has met with Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims. You know that he gathered 160 leaders of the world's 12 major religions in Assisi. Uh, and uh, you had fire worshipers, snake worshipers, spiritists, animists, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims. The Pope said, we're all praying to the same God. Our prayers are creating a spiritual energy to bring about a new climate for peace. So I can see that, that sort of change if you want to call it a change. It doesn't change the core, it doesn't change their dogmas, but it changes the way people perceive the church and therefore could bring a lot more into the church, but always under the Pope. The, the various traditions and the dogmas uh, were developed over time um, out of, I wouldn't say necessity, but expediency. For example, in 1870, you had the First Vatican Council, and uh, they declared the Pope to be infallible. The Council of Constance in the early 15th century met in Constance, Germany. At that time, there were three men who each claimed to be Pope. And the Council of Constance threw them all out and put in a Pope. So that was proof that a council is above the Popes. The fact that the council was above the Pope saved the Catholic Church from a great schism because there were three who claimed to be the Pope, okay? So now in 1870 then, how can you dogmatically declare the Pope to be infallible? Uh, well, you can't really, it's a contradiction, but they did it. Because the Pope wanted to be infallible at that time. He was a very autocratic uh, a man. Now, then you had also uh, he also declared the um, Immaculate Conception of Mary, that she was conceived without sin. It has nothing to do with the virgin birth. Immaculate Conception means she was conceived without original sin. And she lived without sin in order to be the vehicle through whom Christ would be born. But if God, by his grace, could prevent Mary from sinning, then surely Adam and Eve were as immaculately brought into this existence as Mary was. They could have been kept without sinning by the same means, and we wouldn't have had all this mess in the world that we have today, and Christ wouldn't have had, had to die. Now, as a consequence of the supposed immaculate conception of Mary, then nearly a century later, in 1850, another pope declared as a dogma the bodily assumption of Mary to heaven, because if she was immaculately conceived, if she's without sin and death comes because of sin, then she wouldn't die. It, you know, so sometimes one thing follows on another. Now we have a problem because Mary identifies it back to the apparitions. The apparitions identify themselves often 
as the woman clothed with the sun with 12 stars, a crown of 12 stars. That's from Revelation chapter 12. And in fact, the popes have identified Mary as the woman clothed with the sun. But the woman clothed with the sun in Revelation 12, she cries out in pain, travailing in birth to bring forth this child. But birth pangs come because of sin. So if Mary was without sin, she wouldn't have had birth pangs. So you can't have it both ways. But they do their best to develop these traditions and new dogmas in order to build a system that puts people even more un under their control in obligation to them in order to get to heaven. Well, to my Catholic friends, I would say you've got every reason for not trusting this church. It has contradicted itself. It has slaughtered the innocents, one of the chief slaughterers of Jews, for example, down through history. It was the popes who put them in uh, their ghettos, made them wear an identifying hat. Uh, Hitler even said, I'm only doing what the church did for 1,500 years, only I'm going to finish the work. You had popes who lived some of the most horrible lives. You know this. This is a matter of history. Now, why should you trust the popes? Why should you trust the church? Why not trust Jesus Christ? He's the one who died for your sins. And Jesus said, come unto me. Jesus said, I, will, I give my sheep eternal life. He said, I came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't say, you go to a church. Why do you go to this church? Christ died for your sins. He paid the penalty that his own infinite justice demanded. And he offers you eternal life as a free gift. Why not receive it from him? Not through a church, but from Jesus Christ alone. And I would just urge you to do this. If not, the Bible says, he that has the Son, not he that belongs to a church. These are the words of Jesus. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You better see what Jesus himself said and be certain that you are believing him and not some man or group of men who claim to represent him.